To fully understand this story and this curse, we have to go all the way back to 1914. In 1914, baseball was at the end of the dead ball era. A period of baseball where players weren't hitting home runs and baseball's popularity suffered. Baseball needed a star, and they got that in Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth made his rookie debut with the Boston Red Sox in 1914. From then on, he'd become the star pitcher of the team and lead them to not one, not two, but three championships. So where does the curse come in? Where does everything go wrong? Well, for unknown reasons, the Boston front office decided to trade Babe Ruth to the Yankees for only $125,000. Yup, that's it. The Boston Red Sox had traded their best player and superstar to their arch rival for money. And remember when I mentioned earlier that Babe Ruth was a star pitcher? Well, at the end of his career in Boston and his whole time as a Yankee, he had an absolute power surge. And he ranks today as one of the greatest home run hitters of all time. So that's the curse. The curse is that the baseball gods want to get back at Boston for trading away the greatest baseball player of all time. So many people think that this event triggered Boston's World Series drought. Let's see how the curse of Bambino, which is called that because Bambino is one of Babe Ruth's nicknames, holds up for the next couple of decades. So, why are we in 1946? Well, it's been 28 years since the Boston Red Sox last won a World Series. And they finally have a team together that has the potential to win a championship. Led by 27-year-old Ted Williams, who just came off of his World War II duty, a stacked rotation, and other stars, this Red Sox team picked up 104 wins. This team was great and they won the American League. And since there's no playoffs, they go straight to the World Series. In this series, the Red Sox are supposed to play the 98 win Cardinals. This is supposed to be a good series, and it was. Through six games, it was tied 3-3. So it all came down to a game seven. And this is where the curse of Bambino struck. In game seven, in the bottom of the eighth inning, a no slaughter stepped to the plate. He singled. Now, he's on first base. Two batters later, there's two outs. Then, a man named Harry Walker steps up to the plate. He hits a ball into left center. And immediately, a no starts rounding second and ignores the sign and runs past third. It's a close play at home, but he ends up being safe and puts the Cardinals on top. This run and this play would decide the World Series, as the Red Sox weren't able to tie it up in the ninth. This is the first time the curse of the Bambino felt real for so many people. And this play would go down as one of the greatest in Cardinals history, and it's known as Slaughter's Mad Dash. Welcome to 1967 Boston. Many things were happening here. Women were trying to break the gender barrier and compete in marathons. There was a ton of racial tensions and there's a new incarnation of the Boston Red Sox. This team was led by two players, Triple Crown winner and AL MVP, Carl Ustremski and Cy Young winner, Jim Lonborg. Together, these two led the Red Sox through a stacked pennant race for the AL title. But in the end, they won it, and their matchup was once again the St. Louis Cardinals. This Cardinals series is the World Series, because there's still no playoffs in 1967. So who wins Red Sox Cardinals round two? Well, through six games, it was tied 3-3. But as always, the curse comes back to bite Boston. This time, in Game 7, it wasn't even close. 
as Cy Young pitcher Jim Lonborg collapsed to allow a 7-2 victory for the Cardinals. And the star ace for the Cardinals, Bob Gibson, absolutely demolished the Red Sox and gave them no chance. So once again, the Red Sox fall just short. Whether it's the curse or not, it's still heartbreaking. And Red Sox fans everywhere are devastated. In 1975, the Red Sox returned to the playoffs. And yes, there's actual playoffs now. And the Red Sox end up beating the Oakland A's to go to the World Championship yet again. This Red Sox team was pretty good, with yet again a good rotation and a couple of good hitters that include Carl Ustremski still, they have a shot. But to win the World Series, they're going to have to beat the 108 win Cincinnati Reds. And through the first six, it looked pretty good for them, as it was tied 3-3 through six. It's actually a miracle that the Red Sox even got to a game seven, because at the end of game six, with Carlton Fisk hitting in the bottom of the 12th, he had a walk-off home run. This is what sent the series into seven games. So with this new hope, Boston Red Sox fans were thinking, maybe this is the year the curse ends. It turns out they were wrong. So let's flash to game seven. It's the top of the ninth and it's tied 3-3. Ken Griffey Sr. is leading off for the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, you might, you might recognize Ken Griffey's son from somewhere. Anyway, he reaches first on a walk. Then he reaches second on a sacrifice fly. After that, there's a ground out. So that leaves Pete Rose up to bat with two outs. And they decide to intentionally walk him. So that brings up Joe Morgan. He waits for his pitch, it's a low breaking ball, and swings. It goes into center field, and Griffey gets the go-ahead run. Once again, the Cincinnati Reds take a 4-3 lead. The Red Sox then failed to score in the bottom of the ninth, and that means that the Cincinnati Reds have beaten the Boston Red Sox in a seven-game series. This is the third time this has happened to them, and some are thinking, maybe this whole curse thing is real. Welcome to a new decade. This time, we're in the 1980s, specifically 1986 Boston. In 1986, the Red Sox were led by Bill Buckner, Wade Boggs, and Jim Rice. Once again, the Red Sox were good, and they had a great record of 95 and 66. They went on to the AL Championship Series and beat the California Angels 4-3. Their next opponent was the New York Mets in the World Series. Through the first five games, Boston took a 3-2 series lead. Could this be the year? Well, let's go to game six. It's the bottom of the 10th. Game six has gone into extra innings. The Red Sox hold a 5-3 lead over the New York Mets. This is about to be a miracle, as the Mets only have one out left. This is finally gonna be the game that the Boston Red Sox break the curse that has been haunting them for so many years. All there is, is one guy in their way. His name is Gary Carter. Gary Carter waits for his pitch and swings. It's a hit. He keeps the inning alive for the Mets, but Red Sox fans aren't too scared. All they need is one more out. So rookie hitter Kevin Mitchell comes to the plate. He also waits for his pitch, swings, and gets on base. Now Red Sox fans are getting a little nervous. Hitter Ray Knight then steps to the plate. He waits for his pitch, makes contact, and singles. This drives Carter home, making the score 4-5. So, manager comes out and puts in Bob Stanley at pitcher. His hope is that he can hold the two runners at first and second. Mookie Wilson then steps to the plate. After a 2-2 count, a pitch runs inside and goes by him. Wilson then gestures to the guy at third to go home. He scores. Now the game is tied. It's not over yet for the Boston Red Sox, as the game is still tied. And Mookie Wilson hasn't even finished his at-bat. So, how does it end? In the 10th pitch of Mookie Wilson's at-bat, he finally grounds to first. 
all first baseman Bill Buckner has to do is gather the ball and step on first. If he were to do this, the Red Sox would go into extra innings and still have a chance to win it during game six. So Buckner puts his glove down. Unfortunately, the ball rolls right past Bill. This moment gives the Mets the lead and they win the game. In my opinion, this is one of the most horrifying things in baseball history, as you can see the pure pain and shock on Bill Buckner's face. Not only is this a terrible moment for Bill Buckner and the Boston Red Sox, but it also solidifies the curse as not ending yet. After Boston lost in game six in that heartbreaking fashion, all of their momentum was sucked out of them. So they go on to lose game seven. Another heartbreaking and terrible finish for the Boston Red Sox. Welcome to 1997, the time that I pinpointed as a new era for the Boston Red Sox. The 1990s were a time of change. Just two years earlier in 1995, things like the internet were released to the world for the first time. For the Red Sox, however, not much was changing, as once again they found themselves in the hall of mediocrity. Led by power hitter Mo Vaughn, who allegedly was taking steroids, he led the Red Sox to a 78 win season. Mediocre at best. The Red Sox needed a change, and general manager Dan Duquette knew this, so he went out and made that change in the winter of 1997. So what is this move? Well, to understand it, we have to go back to 1994. This is Olympic Stadium, the stomping ground of the Montreal Expos. It's here that in 1994, the Expos had their greatest season in team history. Led by young stars like Larry Walker, Moises Alou, and Pedro Martinez, they led their team to be one of the favorites to win the World Series that year. Unfortunately, in true Expos luck, the season was canceled because of a player's strike. So they ended the season with 74 wins and a big question of what if. In the three seasons following 1994, Montreal wasn't able to get the same momentum they had in 94. So they were looking to move some players and bring some younger talent in. One of the players they decided to move out was star pitcher Pedro Martinez. He was traded for a young prospect, Carl Pavano. The team on the other side that traded Pavano is our Boston Red Sox. Trading Carl Pavano and getting Pedro Martinez is the move we were talking about earlier. This is a great move for the Boston Red Sox, as he had a great ERA in his last season in Montreal. The Red Sox now have their ace. There's a lot to say about him, and we're going to get to a lot of that later. But for now, just know him as the new Red Sox superstar pitcher. In 1998, thanks in part to the acquisition of Pedro Martinez, the Red Sox had a much better record, this time with 92 wins and 70 losses. There were more contributors than just Pedro Martinez, however, as power hitting shortstop Nomar Garcia Para put up crazy numbers and finished second in the MVP vote. Movan also had a really good season at first base. The 98 Boston Red Sox went into the postseason with hope, and they were going to play the Cleveland Indians in the divisional round. Unfortunately, they were really no match for this team, as the Red Sox had a ton of holes one of them being not having a good enough starting rotation. Nevertheless, Boston was confident with their roster, and they didn't make too many moves that winter. A key move they did make was not re-signing Mo Vaughn. So that's the last of him we're gonna see.
1999, the Red Sox did even better than they did in 98, this time with two more wins. Once again, there's not too many roster changes in 99. One thing to note though, is that catcher Jason Veritek has cemented himself as the starting catcher. He will remain in this position until 2004. More excitement was brought to Boston when the 1999 All-Star Game was held there. As with any new event, the All-Star Game brought some new attention to the Boston Red Sox. Another 90-win season means another playoff run, and this year, the Red Sox hope to make it past the divisional round. In the divisional, they were going to meet the Cleveland Indians once again. It's time for round two. Through the first two games, the Red Sox fell down 2-0 to the Indians, only to win the next two. Since it's the NLDS, it's a best of five series. So everything comes down to game five. So let's go to that game. There's a lot to say about game five of the NLDS, and it could be a whole video by itself. But unfortunately, we don't have the time to tell you the whole story. So I'm just gonna give you the short version. Going into game five, pitcher Pedro Martinez wasn't expected to play. Even though they wanted to start him, he had a back injury and wasn't going to be able to play that game. The Red Sox ended up going back on not playing Pedro. As the game neared the 7th inning and the Red Sox found themselves down one run in a 7-8 score, they decided that they should put their ace in, being that it's an all or nothing situation. Pedro, with not very good control and not a good fastball because of his injury, tried his best. And his best was what was needed as he held the Indians to zero runs. The Red Sox then scored four runs in his three innings of relief. And this story has sadly become a footnote in history. But for right now, and for the Red Sox, this is gonna bolt them to the ALCS, thanks to Pedro Martinez. This victory was short-lived, however, as they lost to their division rivals, the New York Yankees, in only five games during the ALCS. 1999 just becomes another year of the curse of Bambino. In 2000, the Red Sox had a down year. They had the same core, just less production. It happens sometimes, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about Pedro Martinez. 2000 was arguably Pedro Martinez's best year as he won Cy Young without taking steroids in the middle of the steroid era. To show you just how dominant he was, I want to show you a specific statistic. Here's the definition of ERA+. Plus. It doesn't really matter. Just know it as another way to measure a player's earned run average. An average ERA plus is around 100. A Cy Young winner's ERA plus is usually around 170. Now, Pedro Martinez's ERA Plus in 2000 was an astounding 291. Almost unheard of, especially in the steroid era. You can even compare Pedro Martinez's ERA Plus to other legends. In Nolan Ryan's best season, he had an ERA Plus of 195. A great number, but it looks small next to Pedro Martinez's ERA Plus. Other than a great season for Pedro, not much happened for the Red Sox. Overall, it was a disappointing season, but they hope to do better next year. In 2001, the Boston Red Sox had another down season this time with even less wins than the year before. There is one upside to this season. They acquired Manny Ramirez in the 2000 free agency, and they had him during this season. He had a great year, but unfortunately, it wasn't enough to will this team to victory. See, this team isn't bad. With stars like newly acquired Manny Ramirez, Nomar Garcia Parra, and Pedro Martinez, they should have been great this year. But injuries cost them a lot, as Nomar Garcia Parra played less than 30 games. This team had many great individual seasons, but as a collective, they just didn't click this season. They hope to do better next year.
93 wins. They've finally done it. This is going to be the storybook ending for the Red Sox. Wait, wait. They, they didn't make the playoffs? How did this happen? Well, it's more unfortunate than anything. As the Yankees finished the season with 103 wins, they won the division, and the Red Sox fell short. So they had to make a wild card, and they didn't make that spot either, falling short to the Anaheim Angels. It's pretty tragic that a 93-win team didn't make the playoffs. But it wasn't all bad this year, as they signed a new GM, Theo Epstein, who will make some big moves in the next couple of years. Also in that offseason, they signed their center fielder that will stay until 2004. His name is Johnny Damon. Overall, it was a solid season for the Red Sox, as guys like Nomar Garcia Parra were able to not get injured that year. So overall, good season and decent progress for the Red Sox, even if they didn't make the playoffs. Two thousand and three was a good year for the Red Sox, to say the least, as the team did a great job and collected ninety five wins. A big part of this is because of new pickup David Ortiz. He was picked up in the off season. He was kind of a why not move because no one really knew if he could play baseball yet because his time on the twins was streaky to say the least. When he got to Boston, however, he established himself as a great player by putting up good numbers immediately. He will be a valuable piece for not only 2004, but many years onward. Ortiz wasn't the only good player picked up that offseason, as they also purchased Kevin Millar's contract from the Miami Marlins. He will not only play an important role in 2003, but he will also be a key player in 2004. This time, a 90-win season got them into the playoffs, and their opponent was the Moneyball Oakland A's. It was a tough five game contested series, but in the end, the Red Sox won. They're going to go to the ALCS and face their rivals, the Yankees, yet again. In the early 2000s, the Yankees have developed an even more bitter rivalry between each other, as it seems like every time they play each other, a fight boils over. And that's no different in this really intense ALCS. It got so bad at one point that in game three of the series, Pedro Martinez threw 72-year-old coach of the Yankees, Don Zimmer, to the ground. Not only was this just an uncomfortable scene to watch, the Red Sox didn't even win the game. So what's the series score? Well, through the first six, the series was split down the middle 3-3. And we all know how the Red Sox are. So let's go to the game seven. This is another one of those games where it could be a whole video by itself, but once again, we don't have time for that. So I'll cut to the chase. In the bottom of the 11th inning, with a tie game, Aaron Boone steps to the plate for the Yankees. He swings and hits a home run and walks off the game. The Yankees have beaten the Red Sox in game seven of the ALCS to advance to the World Series. This happened again to the Red Sox. Another game seven loss. Will the Red Sox ever, ever win a World Series? Well, they should just wait until next year. In 2004, the Red Sox collected 98 wins, their most since 1946. They didn't stop making moves before the season, however, as they picked up shortstop Pokey Reese from free agency, and they also picked up second baseman Mark Bellhorn. They didn't stop making moves during the season either, as they traded longtime all-star Nomar Garcia Parra for multiple role players who will provide depth off the bench. This wasn't the only big move they made in the middle of the season either, as they traded for all-star pitcher Kurt Schilling. Schilling will serve as a top ace for the Red Sox in 2004. And don't worry, the Red Sox didn't give up much, just a couple of prospects. The last big move the Red Sox made was hiring a new manager, as they hired Terry Francona from the Philadelphia Phillies. With the new manager and a partly refreshed roster, the Red Sox were ready to compete in the playoffs, and this time they hoped to book their ticket to the World Series. So let's find out how they did. In the ALDS, the Red Sox found themselves facing the Anaheim Angels. 
the same team that stole their playoff spot years earlier. And they got revenge on them, getting a 3-0 victory of the series and moving on to the ALCS yet again. To face, I think you know who, the New York Yankees. This is supposed to be a heavily contested series with a ton of battles and great baseball. So let's see how the Red Sox do through the first three games. Wow, that happened quick. Through the first three games, the Yankees took a commanding 3-0 series lead, even beating the Red Sox at Fenway Park 19-8 in Game 3. The Red Sox need a miracle. They're down 3-0. It looks like the Chris Bambino is not ending yet. So let's see how the next three games go. The Red Sox got their miracle, and in games 4, 5, and 6, they took back the series to even it up at 3-3. So in classic Red Sox fashion, this series is going to go to a game 7. The Red Sox have defied all logic and sense of reality. They've won a game 7, and they're going to the World Series. And if this story is not good enough for you yet, their opponent will be the St. Louis Cardinals. The team that they lost to twice in the World Series, twice in Game 7s. It's almost poetic. Will the baseball gods allow this to happen? Will they give them the fairy tale ending? Will they let the curse of Bambino be broken? One thing is for sure, that this upcoming World Series is going to be a hard fought battle for victory. The Red Sox have done it. They've taken a 3-0 lead in a World Series. They are going to have to pull three Bill Buckners to push it to a Game 7. So, there's one more win in the way of the Boston Red Sox in a World Championship. So, let's go to Game 4. It's the bottom of the ninth inning. The Red Sox hold a 3-0 lead in Game 4. There's one out left for the St. Louis Cardinals, and Edgar Renteria for the Cardinals is trying to push the game to a game five. Keith Folk makes his pitch. It bounces back to him. He throws it to first base, and the Red Sox break the curse. Finally, after years of suffering, years of getting so close but so far, after a walk-off home run in the ALCS, the Red Sox have finally done it. They have beaten the curse the curse of the Bambino has fallen. And more importantly, the baseball gods have forgiven Boston. I don't think I fully understood the depth and complexity and action of this story when I started. But the deeper I got, the more I understood what being a Boston Red Sox is. What being a baseball team is. Every year, the Red Sox would hear about the failures. Every year, they were punched down. But every year, the fans and the city stuck with their team. Baseball is a game of failure. You fail eight times out of ten. The way you respond to those failures is what makes you great. The Red Sox failed time and time again only to get back up again with their head held high. If there's one thing to be learned from this story, it's to have integrity in defeat. Because just like the Red Sox, your time will come. And that is the lesson of baseball.
was Eddie Scazzeri. The big guy's here. It's like, here. Like right? I had a choice. <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, baby. Did you ever think, baby? Did you ever think we'd see the day? When Chuck Nixon, this is Wade Boggs in reverse.